This is Perry Elgar, from the Live from the House of Court in New York City, and I'm here with my dedicated co-host, Jeanette Davis. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> and with our new distinguished guest, Mr. G James Gibson, a man who was wrong, wrongfully convicted and put behind bars for a crime he didn't commit, and who has a fascinating story to tell about um, how his uh, incarceration led to um, actually revealing serious corruption within the system. Say hello, James. Hi, everyone. This, hi, I hope everyone is safe and well. This is James Gibson. I am James Gibson. <laughs> Now, we want to start it off by allowing you to uh, tell your story from the beginning, where you were born, where you grew up, and then from there, how this morphed into the situation that you ended up facing, and then going to the situation where you were explaining how other attorneys around the world got involved, how you ended up um, revealing so much about the corruption within the system, and how you even turn down all of that money. That was that was amazing. So we want you to start it off in your own words, you know, where you were born, your humble beginnings, and we'll take it from there. This story is, uh, first I'd like to say, this story is so uh, unique. It's hard to tell the public where do you start from. My name is James Gibson. I was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1966. My mother was uh, what they call uh, handicapped. She couldn't hear it. You know what I'm saying? But um, she had raised a fine family with the deck stacked against her, African American. You know what I'm saying? Already a strike against her and couldn't help. You know what I'm saying? Raised me up to the point where I was able to get out of the nest and graduate out of high school with honors. Went on to college, began to get, began to get married. My two sisters, she, she raised them up. One of them became a law enforcement agency, organized crime detective. Uh, um, my other sister still worked for the government to this day, 40 years. So my mother did everything she could possibly do to get me up out the nest. You know what I'm saying? But the system, you know what I'm saying, has never been fair. People ain't going to believe it unless they see it and they read it. You know what I'm saying? The facts, you know what I'm saying, it came down through the court. First ruling in the country in 300 years. Um, there's six other cases that came before, but um, there's never been a ruling of tort in any high courts in uh, any of the states across the United States in America in 200 years. I'm the first case that they ever ruled that an African American has been taught to collaborate and prove. And this case is not only about torture, torture, about malicious prosecution, false imprisonment, the wrong guy. They knew from the beginning that they had the wrong guy. And my mm -hmm. story is about to come out and be told um, my case controls the Jewish dissonance subject matter. I'm president of the establishment, torture center, a memorial. They teach it a part of the Corinthian here in Illinois, Illinois Torture Relief Commission Act, in law in which I enacted and changed from within the penitentiary. So to give the public a little bit of information about me, because it's so much that I've um, that I've been taken through, but yet God is still in control. I stood in a cell door for 30 years and they couldn't break me. It's always been stacked against us, you know what I'm saying, in this, in this country, you know, as far as um, our due process, the protection of the law, just because of the color of our skin. But nevertheless, I was home on a, um, a holiday vacation, falsely arrested. My brother and several other guys had been arrested because um, two people had been um, killed um, around my mother's house. But one was an uh, African-American and a white Caucasian. They arrested my brother. And by my mother, she couldn't hear, contacted me to call down to the station to find out what was going on with my brother. I did that. But before I could, before I could get off the telephone, they had um, surrounded the house. And I guess they must have tracked the phone number. And they came in. You know how they come on a murder investigation or suspect or whatever. They come. They come deep, 10, 15 deep. I don't know. For the record, a lot of things I, I can't go into because I'm litigating against the state in which I just won 30, 30 counts out of my 33 count indictment against the state of Illinois. But for legal reasons, I can't go into a lot of details. But I'm going to tell you what's a part of the record. It's been a part of the record since 1989, all the way up to the day I was exonerated, given a certificate of innocence, and uh, finally given all my rights back to vote. To get, um, a, a, a passport, etc. I was arrested. I was taken into custody. I was beaten. I was, beaten. I was, I was held into custody for 98 hours. And I didn't know that I had been held in custody 98 hours because I, I, I um, I'm assuming that I had been knocked out a couple of times in which the record they had kept moved me around in different rooms. And I can't recall how I got in those rooms. So I'm just assuming that I must have been knocked out 
during the process. But nevertheless, I was held in the custody for 98 hours. Whether they held African American in custody for 98 hours and then released. I was released after they allegedly said that I made a confession, double homicide. But what happened was in the record, my sister, this is a part of the record of, uh, uh, in the National Archives of Exonerees and part of this case uh, record, she was in the military and she worked at the Pentagon and she was on a military flight from Washington, D.C. to stop over Leo, which is Illinois, to leave and go over to Korea or Germany, whatever it was, and she had a, a stopover. And when she came over and found my mother's house that her two brothers had been arrested, um, she went to question the police station about where her brothers was. Her brother, her little brother, I, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know my brother had been released and everybody else, but it's all part of the record. They released me. And when they released me, I didn't know that it was against the law to beat you, to beat a person. You know what I'm saying? So my sister had, uh, by being the size in the army, had went to take Jewish dishes and to arrest Don Burgess or whatever. She started calling around and found, and found out that uh, it was unconstitutional for, for them, for the police to beat me. I didn't know who the Don Burgess was, but I never heard about that. Midnight crew, the house of scream, and none of these things. But my sister was in the military and she called and they told her to, to report it. And when she reported it, um, they said that she couldn't make a report on a person that had been beaten against the law enforcement agency. That person must make that report. And so uh, my sister gave me the telephone and I told the OPS what had happened to me. They were supposed to send a car to get me the next day and, uh, you know, because I couldn't identify all of the uh, uh, officers at the time because they had only left a um, um, breeding card at my mother's house. You know what I'm saying? And the detective that had came in that had been whooping on me and burnt me and broke my ribs and all this other stuff, they, they didn't have no badges on or no name tags, but they had left a business card for me at my mother's house. And so OPS had told me they were going to contact me the next day. My sister left the, the country the next day, and, the, and John Burgess and his crew came back and arrested me, and they charged me with a double murder. And then they took me into the system, and they said I had been identified in the lineup, but I never was identified in the lineup. Somebody was identified in the lineup, but it wasn't James Gibson, Peter Gunn, but they said it was me. I'm AKA Peter Gunn. Were you ever in a lineup? I was in three lineups, and they told me that I was identified in the lineups, but I wasn't identified, and I didn't know that I wasn't identified in the lineup to 25, 26, 27 years later, until the state of Illinois told me that I wasn't the one identified in the lineups. You know what I'm saying? That's another story about this case that's how it's so crazy. So nevertheless, uh, uh, I was taken into custody, and when I got in front of the chief judge, they told me to put my hands behind my back. And when I put my hands behind my back, my left rib cage popped out of my chest. Ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, the chief judge, the chief judge, he stopped the proceedings and took me into his chambers and had the state's attorney and the public defender and the investigators to come in to take pictures of my injuries. So they recorded my injuries and the judge signed all the documents and they put it in what they call today a motion of discovery. And then they took me and they put me in a hospital for two weeks and then I was, when I was released, they put me in front of another judge. And so I had went to, I had went to court and trial on a six hour trial for, for a double capital murder, death penalty, and sentence to prison. Wow. And, so when I, and so when I got in prison, I didn't know that um, um, I had been making a record every time I had approached the judge about the issue that had happened to me. I didn't know that they did, I didn't know that they knew that they had the wrong guy. I didn't know that the state's attorney had wrote a memo to the boss telling them, we got the wrong guy. But the boss wrote him back telling them, don't worry about it. By the time he figured it out, he'll be dead. I didn't know that they knew that they knew that wasn't me that was identified in the lineup. I didn't know that they knew about the chief judge and the photograph. I didn't know, but then the John Burgess called me from the Area 3 police station to the county jail. I didn't know that they had the technology to go back in time and get that phone call that the chief of police called me while I was still in the county jail telling me, you ain't gonna never, never get, out get out of jail and ain't nobody boy. gonna believe your story. But to God be the glory, I met a man while I was in prison. Years later, the late, great Hugh Hefner, rest in peace. Um, he did an article about, about, about the issue that I was fighting inside prison. It's called Area 2. It's by, it's by Playboy Magazine, um, Hugh Hefner. And uh, if you look at the record, uh, uh, I wrote over uh, 10,000 letters. I wrote every media outlet in America. I wrote every Congress, Senator, State Legislator, President, United Nations, uh, 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 Department of Justice, every U.S. Attorney General, Every governor, every state's attorney, every special prosecutor, 
in America. I removed six special prosecutors in this case. I removed five judges and four state's attorneys. Since my litigation started, I've cost the city of Chicago $673 million. In wow. now, mm. I am, I'm James Gibson. I, I filed 33 appeals pro se in the courts. I won my last three. They published People versus James Gibson. I done brought home 20 guys and it cost the city of Chicago $13 million mm. since my litigation. Nevertheless, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, um, and so... Um, um, oh, we want to hear it. We I, was prosecuted, I was prosecuted and uh, uh, I started writing uh, letters to prison because I realized I knew one thing about this country, that I was an American citizen, that I was born on the greatest continent on earth and that we was a country of laws and policies. And when I graduated out of high school in honors, I took the government and I knew that I had a constitutional right under the 14th Amendment, due process of law, and protection of law. And one day I saw a movie when I was inside the county jail. It was an old show called The Perry Mason Show. And Perry Mason had came and he was filing motions. And I went to court from the county jail and I asked the judge. I said, so um, I seen on TV that um, the lawyers pulled the file A, Y, and Z. And the judge told me it wasn't no TV, but I said, man, I still is. I know one thing about TV and the reality is that it's due process and protection of the law. And every time I went in front of the judge since I was 23 years old, I was challenging my constitutional right. I filed the first case lawsuit in the country history that didn't ask for any money. The only thing I asked for was a new trial and a fair trial up on the equal protection law. It became almost the biggest class action, but they denied the class action of the case and the judge granted us a five point criteria that if we meet a certain bar that you can have an evidentiary hearing, special prosecutors and a, and a new trial. And then I won that and removed the special prosecutors that the judge granted to be the special prosecutors, put it up, it's in the archives, people were saying, nevertheless, and, and, and when I was in prison, because I wouldn't take any deals, they offered me five deals. They put me in front of the door, five years in the winter time. I floated in toilet water in Menard. I've been in the pits of Pontiac. I've been in Joliet Stateville. I've been in the dungeon and they couldn't get me. They offered me five deals, two deals to withdraw my four arguments before they even be done. $100,000. $100,000 reprimand. You know, Chicago is the first city in the nation that African-Americans has ever been issued reprimand. Did you know that? They don't even talk about that in the country. This concludes this session of the Hustle Squad in New York City. Thank you so much for joining us and checking out this show and taking the time out of your day to come and join us. If you like what you see, once again, please show me love. Share this content on your Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds. And also help us grow by liking, leaving a comment, and also um, subscribing. So once again, if you are a person who was incarcerated or a active in the community or convicted of a crime you didn't commit or a musician, an artist, a performing artist, and or a woman that has traumatic stories that you've overcome or a black business owner come share your story on the hustle corner in new york city in any one of our categories and we'll give all of your businesses your organizations your books your music a shout out once again this is parallel delf coming at you live from the hustle corner new york city saying thank you so much for joining us looking forward to you coming and being with us again peace and chill out